Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, let's go on to approval of previous month's minutes. Um, Questions or comments about the minutes for the media and review? Shall we move through? Having looked at the second minutes from Jill, I do. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor of approval? Yeah. Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll do the water statue for sure. Um, Flow at the St. Rain this morning. Uh, data in was uh, 71 CFS. The historical average uh, is 113 CFS. Um, the column in the St. Rain Creek is the Paulington Ditch, and that's an 1865 water rate. Um, and the column in the South Platte River is Sterling Number no. 1, which is an 1888 water rate. Um, Ralph Price Road Award is full on spilling. With approximately two tenths going over the spill line. And the Newman Reservoir is at an elevation of 26 feet, I believe. So I think we got it down to it right there now. Yeah, 26 feet, I have 27 there. And which is uh, 12,438 acre feet. Or no, it's 11,324 acre feet. We're Question. releasing the 16 CFS originally. Questions for Joe? Thanks, Councilman. Any public I'm glad to be here. Any agenda revisions? I have none. What's more about development activities? Is that a report for this one? Well, yeah, um, for a oh yes, sorry. Before we jump, before in. you jump in, Mr. Chair, if you will, I uh, I'm sorry, am uh, counsel of record for the uh, person who's petitioning for the, the water race. So I'd like to recuse myself, so I'm not participating in the discussion or taking the order in this particular matter. Okay. Right. So is there a best place for me to go ahead? <laughs> um, you can you can be nice. You office? want. Well, I can get you. I'll be I'll be locatable. You can go sit in my office if you want. We're on the other side. There's a phone booth thing around this corner. Thanks. I just didn't want to get in the way. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, before I start the presentation, I'd like to introduce Mark McLean. Um, he's representing the uh, applicant in case of any questions on the police. Um, we have a very pretty standard water supply agreement lease in front of you. Um, we actually have an existing 20 year lease with LWM washout that we entered into from 2008. Of 2028. Uh, there's five years left on that agreement. Uh, the state of Colorado, when you have an augmentation, uh, what the water supply agreement for an augmentation project, and, and they plan on augmenting some wells, or they are augmenting some wells, but they pull off the South Platte Alluvial Aquifer just east of Greeley a little bit. They operate a solar washing facility out there and takes on a little bit look for the facilities. Basically, it has to be augmented. The, the, the leashes from the wells have to be augmented for the same South Platte River. Um, the state of Colorado requires you to have um, water supply in hand for the term full term or the lag completion of your augmentation plan. So in, in case we've got about a five year lag return impact on the Platte River. 
So even though we still have five years left on the original agreement, we're not starting the next water year as you know, probably intended. We won't be able to hold the wells because then it would be uh, five years after that. It would be outside the scope of our current lease. And so what we're asking for basically is a five-year extension of the lease they have. Um, we typically only do a 10-year um, water board directed staff a number of years ago. Had some time ago to not enter the water supply agreements beyond 10 years uh, for concern of well, how far out can we see? Yeah. Uh, 10 years is a long, long ways to take out. We were doing 20 years lease, in fact, this lease considers only 20 years. But, um, so we have pretty much told everybody that you know, we limited leases to 10 years. So essentially, what this would do would be we'll, we'll terminate the existing 20 year lease, the remaining five years on it. We'll enter into a new 10 year lease. The effect is really just five more years uh, past what we already had. It's a pretty small amount of water, so um, we certainly have that right now. Um, water delivered would be either effluent, for it would be first effluent from the wastewater treatment plant, and then secondly, water, like some of the water stored in the Union Reservoir. So it won't uh, impact one of our ability to deliver water um, to our uh, citizens at all. So anyway, um, staff is recommending uh, that we approve it. Uh, Mark's here to answer any questions if there are any questions on the agreement. Uh, I would, if Water Board so chose to make a recommendation to Council to approve the agreement, I would ask that it be done in the motion be in substantially the form before Water Board because we still we still is in final review with our city attorney's office and they may make a few small changes. I don't expect any because this is a form or a template. <laughs> I use it as a template, but we, we might have a small non-substantive change. So um, that's really all I have. Um, just recommending that uh, Water board make recommendations to the council to approve. If it if so done, well, it'll go. Since it's a multi year, it, it, it requires approval by council of all parties. So, um, we'll go forward to the council in yeah. September. Any questions for Dan yeah, about this agreement? Yeah, I'm Dan. I have no issues with this, you know, agreement, lease agreement. The question I have is the original cost per acre was 258. We're jumping it to 641. What is it currently? It, it, it's 641. It's 641 today? Yeah. Okay. And how often do you anticipate doing this cost analysis to, I mean, over a 10 year period? I suspect that it's going to move. Every 10 years. <laughs> yeah. it, it, I, it doesn't happen every doesn't three, happen. five years. Or, okay. It happens about every other rate setting. When the city does a full loan rate setting for all of our water rates, the water rate consultant is then asked to do a, as part of your study, do a rate setting. I think there's a rate setting coming up, and I think we've only got through 2024, is our current um, rates, water rates set by council, and then we'll do a rate study to set the 25, 26, 27 rates. Um, probably that will be looked at there. I haven't done it yet, but I'm pretty sure it will be. Um, so this rate will stay. This is the current rate they're paying because the last time we the rate was set, we jumped to 641. We'll stay here for five years and then it'll be whatever, maybe two or three years or longer. It will be whatever that is. Other questions? Yes. Um, maybe for the purposes of education rather than. Problem with the agreement. Um, can you describe just a little bit some of the assumptions that the state or whoever makes um, with respect to how somebody gets credit for a groundwater recharge from effluent from on the surface? So, like, what are, what are some of the mechanisms by which those assumptions are? So they do a they do an analysis of, from the well to the what is impacted. In their case, it's the South Platte River. 
and then they, you know, you pump in this month so much water, its depletion lights out. And I don't know, the first depletion is probably quite a while. Yeah, it's fairly, fairly long. Um, but the most important thing is the distance from the well to the river because the, the relationship is a square of the distance. So you double the distance, increase the time by four, for example. So this one's a ways from the river far enough that it creates a five-year depletion, meaning that if you pump it in one month, the river won't feel that total pumping effect until five years has gone by. And so the state wanting to make sure that the placement water is available when the well gets shut off and it doesn't carry out and injure somebody by creating a shortage, they require that that water be provided for those five years. And is that does that analysis get updated periodically, or is that? That one's set by decree by the court in the augmentation plan, actually, that Mr. Holwick and myself adjudicated. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. Do we have any other use for our fluid or other entities? We do. We have a number of other leases similar to this lease. Um, our, our first use is for our own water rights cases, we have um, return flow obligations. We use water often to change the water right, and we have to replicate the historical return flow to the stream. And so that becomes, when we use the water, then that becomes a debt we own to the river. Um, and that, that's made up a couple of different components, like ditch loss, building up. Return flow from subsurface and from corporate tailwater lines. All that makes up an obligation that Longmont has when we use our water lines. So, the first thing we do is meet all of our return flow obligations. Then we um, have a major exchange agreement with Public Service Company of Colorado where we deliver them fully consumable effluent that they can use in an augmentation plan. And in exchange, we get water, uh, their CBP water. So we get water out the wastewater treatment plant, water in from Carterville. And so that's our, it's kind of our secondary use of it. And then if there's anything surplus from that, then we can lease that surplus water. Uh, it's really a, primarily it helps raise revenue to, to stabilize water rates and it literally hundreds of thousands of these all every year. Um, but it's only excess water to what we have downstream. Um, one of the ways we um, do it is um, MLS is ordering different water to the plant. We order CBT water, it's not fully consumable, so we have to let it out of the wastewater plant, it's, it's fine. If we need a little bit more F, of the effluent to be fully consumable, then we can convert it into windy gap, or we can use water stored in that rock from fully consumable sources. And so we're always balancing how much of the water out of the wastewater plant is fully consumable, reusable, and how much is not, as well as water stored in Union Reservoir, of course, is fully consumable. So that's Could you say that again one more time for me to hear it? So CDT is not fully consumable? It is not. It's a single-use water, okay. um, and that's because the, the, the original water right is owned by the U.S. government. Okay. They then contracted with Northern Water to distribute the water. Okay. So Northern Water distributes the water. In their distribution of the water, in the allotment <coughs> contracts that everybody signs to be able to get an allotment of water, the CBD water, the um, Federal government allowed Northern Water to have the reuse rights because it's trans -based. Yes. So it's fully consumable. The reuse portion of that was kept by Northern Water. Um, and then that goes down to all water users in the South Platte Basin that are in the Northern District. Back in 1937, when they went to a vote to, um, to convince everybody up and down the river some people were on wells, some people didn't have augmentation, and they didn't have augmentation, I think. Some people are on wells, they didn't need the water, others 
weren't under his controls to get it. And of course, for the, before they go downstream, the RVs get the water down there. So everybody is tax, has been taxed since 1937. So in as part of that taxing authority, they were promised well, there will be greater water supply for everybody in the South Platte Basin because the reuse of this water, once it's used, will accrue back to the stream and anybody who's in the district can, can use it. So when... So even though it's import water, it's not fully consumable? Not to the Alati, not to, to, to the Alati. Long long. But it is to Northern and Northern shares it amongst all of its tax base. Yeah, That's exactly. It. Everybody, and really what it does is it goes down to the next diverting ditch, it diverts water and irrigates land that's in the district. They then can divert that. So it benefits everybody all the way to Chelsea. You're not too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's a little bit harder. It's, it's, I guess it's not sort of an indirect, indirect benefit to the lower part of the river. It would literally take an act of Congress to change. Right. Yeah, and it would so, because that's set by Congressional Act, U.S. Congress Act, and, and in effect has some gives some restriction to the Longmont to use a something like Denver Water does, right? To like reuse water. It, it restricts Longmont using that as a solution Correct. potentially in the future. Right? Correct. Yeah. So I mean Denver Water's been very effective, right? At, at water use, but that would only be an option for us on the our water use. And I don't know how the accounting would be um, well, we can show you that someday. <laughs> we do. That every day. Okay. So it can, it is done. It can be done. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do that someday. But um, yeah, it, it, we, you know, it, how much we put out the wastewater plant is pretty consistent, almost yeah. year round. Yeah. It has been for thirty years. <laughs> it's just uh, you know straight line, but we balance how much of that we need. Over time, we need more and more um, for consumable effluent, so we increase the percentage of both windy gap and trans transferred water as fully consumable. Okay. Tom, I'm sorry, did you make a motion? I don't remember. I don't know if I said it. But I could have a bell on what we say this then. Is there a motion to approve this agreement? Uh, if I remember the wording correctly, um, I I so move in substantially the same form as we discussed. Second. Yeah. Any second? All in favor? Say aye. 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 Okay. Yeah, I, I was a few minutes late. Oh, all right. Sorry, I Sorry. Sorry. That's because I'm, I'm behind all these big guys. <laughs> Dan, especially. That's the excellent thing you just told us there. Right, you told us. <laughs> Scott, the extension of this agreement was passed, so I'll keep doing this then. Or <laughs> Thanks, twenty thirty-three. So, right. item ten. Ten. Um, yeah, just a quick update on the Windy Gap Farming Project. Um, we had a very successful tour. Um, the uh, the chair enjoyed it. Yeah, it was good. It's, uh, if we have time, I don't know, we'll move on for your folks or give us about a 20 minute dissertation on it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, we talked about this Stand on by. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's quite impressive. It, I, you can explain that little black line there. I, I yes, I'd be happy to. Um, I'll do that. So this is a recent, uh, just last Monday. So 
This is a recent picture of the uh, reservoir site. But yeah, we had a we had a good tour up there today. Basically, the, the this was taken from the overlook where you look down on the project, um, and and the tours. Not everybody could make today's tour, but I have a number of tours, uh, and you can sign up directly with Northern Water. So if anybody is interested in doing you know, another one of those tours at a later date, um, just real real briefly, you can see this is the uh, footprint for the um, dam, and it's actually. If you look right here, you can see the dam starting to come up. So there's actually a, an embankment there now. Um, last time we were out there, I don't know, the dam was like 40 foot tall and it wasn't even up to ground level yet. So <laughs> it did, there's nothing that looked like a dam, but, but now, now it's there. So um, this is the main rock fill. It's a rock fill dam with a hydraulic asphalt cord. You can now, what was, really neat today is you could really you know, that hydraulic asphalt core is starting to get wide enough uh, long enough that you can it's not wide at all it's only three three and a half foot wide um, long enough that you can really see you go oh there you know there's that hydraulic asphalt core um ironically the machine was right where it is on this picture uh, when we were out there um, so they were they were going along quite well uh and uh, they don't have anything to, this is the rock, um, rock crushing operation here, They're sorting the quarry is over here, and uh, the pipeline that will deliver water to the reservoir comes right down here and down there. So, so anyway, that's, that's what it looks like right now. Um, looking pretty good, but wanted to kind of show you progress wide. So if you can remember that last picture, that's where the um, dam embankment construction is right now. So that's a little further in, in terms of the full width of the da um, dam. Uh, we're up about 130, 40 feet right now. This is, this is if you cut a cross section here, um, it looks like it's well on its way, <laughs> uh, you know, because of how much has been replaced. Although this is original ground level right here, so you can see a lot of the construction was the foundation below ground level. But it's now going up. Um, we've hit this part right here, so it's all of a sudden the hydraulic asphalt core placement is taking a lot longer. Um, it, it's kind of slowed them down because they're now literally trying to get this part done. The first part of that hydraulic asphalt core has, has to be hand applied. The machine can't lay it down. So they're hand applied in the first layer all the way down here. That kind of put them back a little and it's taking a little bit. Once, once they get over to here, then the hand application is nothing but this. this they you just kind of hit a spot. And the dam is suddenly going to get much more much longer. Um, but um, that's that's uh, just kind of shows where the construction is right now. One of the things I did want to talk about real quick, so is the schedule and uh, uh, the performance on the contract. Right now, we're about two years into the four-year construction period, about halfway, not quite half, almost halfway through. Um, and generally are on target, um, but they, to, to stay on timing, um, they had to go to um, you know, 20 hour a day, 20, 24 hour a day, some of the operations 24 hours a day, most of it's 20 hours a day, six days a week. Uh, one other time it said seven, but I thought about that. Might have been six, but they're having to increase production a little bit to stay on track. So. All in all, they're, they're going quite well. Um, in terms of the project, uh, the original contract was about was 500 million, uh, 21 million in change orders. Uh, so uh, the revised contract is 529. Now, there, this does not include, this figure here does not include the uh, 
cost for the federal litigation. And so that was pretty significant. And um, as a, in terms of the overall cost of the project, will be should be counted, you know, as part of the overall cost. This is this is just an amount that's going to a contractor. So um, uh, it's uh, a contractor. There was a change order with the contractor for the federal litigation delay cost because of the federal litigation. It's not included in the sort of actual um, and, and the reason I wanted to highlight this this month is we're finally kind of getting the final numbers and um, we'll be setting our cash in lieu in September. So we're going to be coming back in September with a lot more detail on the cost. <clears throat> looking hard at not only the cost of the project, but what we expect it to be um, because we believe we want to present the water board the full picture. Uh, you know, this this is the project that we're using as part of our cash and lieu calculation. The cash and lieu will be up for review in September. So we'll be looking much harder at all these numbers next month and making some decisions on how does that impact our cash and lieu calculations. Uh, and that 529 um, or 530, that doesn't include litigation? It does not include litigation. We'll bring all that back next month. So would you anticipate a quarter of cash in lieu to review? Are you looking at these numbers as quarter of day? Um, or is that, I mean, we, is we, that too often to? Um, it won't, we probably should look at it at yeah, each quarterly one, but it, it won't, okay. it won't change the number. I, I think it will in September or December. One of, one of those two reviews, I think they'll probably want to look at it pretty hard and decide um, what that impact might be or how you might include it. But, and, you know, yeah, we'll bring you that. We bring that data as part of the, but, but we don't change it until there's actually, um, this change order, 21.8, you've already calculated in your cash flow. There was a contingency amount I can't remember the exact number, but round number is about $50 million um, for the project. Uh, and that was included in the original calculation. So as it, so every quarter, even though every quarter we'll bring that information in, until it changes, until we expand all the contingency funds, um, we, we, it won't need to, it won't affect cash and loop. Once we, once we exceed Contingency, and which would then mean we'd have to come up with more money, it will. Other than that federal litigation, we now kind of know all the costs of that, and we may want to look at, we will want to look at that and decide if we include it or not include it in cash and lieu, and if we do, how we do it. So all of that stuff's going to have to be looked at in September. But um, this this tells us as far as contingency, okay. but um, not, not including. Sorry. Could you go back to some of the slides? Just something I learned today that I might share that might be interesting. This line here is the, is the asphalt that they're pouring. And they say they can put up to nine times two, nine inches to twice, they go through this in a day. So they, this thing raises the dam, this part, the whole dam raises 18 inches a day. And the other thing, Correct me if I'm wrong, Ken or Hope. Is they make the asphalt up here, do they not? Correct. And they truck it on down here, go across these ramps, and fill this little truck as needed, which is kind of, kind of it's all, all the stuff is made right there, whether it's asphalt, bring the rock in, what have you, it's kind of a do it yourself right there in the backyard. So, and one other thing is, the people making the asphalt, are they Swiss people? Yeah. Well, Portuguese. Portuguese, well, Portuguese, Portuguese laborers of the Swiss company. Yeah, but the Swiss are they're putting together, they're running all the mixture goes. And, I mean, this is something the U.S. doesn't know very much about. Europe, they know a lot about it. So anyway, that's what I learned today. <laughs> <laughs> My takeaway. Right? Yeah, it is very interesting because this, 
This lay down machine is kind of unique because it, they, they put the hydraulic asphalt in there. They also put the sand filter on each side. So it's laying three, it's laying a, a layer, layer of sand filter, the hydraulic asphalt cord, and the sand filter. It's laying three zones of the dam at one time. The sand yes. filter is kind of the walls that keep the asphalt. Yeah. Portion. Right. So transition from yeah. hydraulic asphalt to a fine sand lens to a small rock lens to the actual rock fill. Yeah. What I miss, Holden. Seal of approval. And finally, this is just for informational purposes. This is an actual hydraulic asphalt core placement, and, and because it hit that, um, it's hit that long straight pod, plus uh, they're trying to, the uh, grouter, grout company is doing grouting, trying to keep ahead of the last hydraulic asphalt core placement. They're, they're a little behind schedule in the hydraulic asphalt core, and there's a lot of concern about can they got to get that hydraulic asphalt core going, otherwise they're going to be behind schedule. <laughs> you know, that's the first thing that goes down. So um, if that doesn't stay on schedule, then the whole project can't stay on schedule. Is the hydraulic asphalt core affected by uh, weather? Like, meaning can they work through winter? They can. They actually can do better in winter. Okay. They actually had to shut down a couple of weeks ago when it was hot. Um, because they put it down at like 350, 360, which is like 70 degrees hotter to get down asphalt on a road. I mean, really hot asphalt for placement. And it has to cool down enough that they can put another man on top of it. And so they actually, um, if you look at those pictures that you can see every week, if you look at some of the snow pictures, there's no snow on the, <laughs> on the, on the okay. asphalt core. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, it's really, now, you know, we get one of our famous blizzards is 24 inches deep. And you can't get the workers up there, but, uh, and you can't get around up there, but, but by and large, um, it's really the 95 to 100 degree plus days that slows them down more than the cold weather, which I learned that today. <laughs> <laughs> it comes down in a lip, almost a liquid form, is it not? Yeah. Our truck was Washing around and just bringing it down. So, you know, asphalt, as we know, is kind of a, a material, but this is kind of a lucky that I. Well, it's it, the hydraulic asphalt has basically about double the asphaltic content, the street yeah. asphalt. Yeah. And, that's, and then you put it at 350 degrees. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so, anyway, that's, that's the only. So that's my report on movie. Yeah, so it's still going well. The uh, Colorado River Connectivity Channel portion of the project is going well as well. Um, they um, pretty much, I don't know if you remember, we were talking about last spring during the runoff. We had a bigger runoff on the West Slope than we thought, anybody thought we would because of the higher snowpack. And that actually inundated the, cof the, the coffer dam that was keeping the, the main dam construction dry and tumbled. So it had, had some bad pattern to mind. But that, that's all cleaned up now. And they're back. And now they've raised the dam, the new dam embankment, high enough that um, we won't have a problem. One of those things that happened in construction. <laughs> so that's what we uh, are you going to go over the Colorado letter and Colorado River? Yeah, I, um, we just put that in the packet for mostly for informational purposes for the board, um, and then also to give me a chance to editorialize. <laughs> uh, if you if you read those letters, I really I really did appreciate the letter, especially the Colorado letter, even the Upper Colorado um, River Commission letter. They, they really were focusing on, hey, um, we, we need to look at how we do the um, 
operating criteria for the federal reservoirs on the Colorado River because it's not working. I mean, the hydrology is not the same. We need to take it, we need to agree to that. We need to take that into account. We need to operate the, the project. The, the lower unknown color. The lower river has been over drafting the Colorado River forever, and uh, that that actually is contained in the uh, operating the federal operating guidelines and rules uh, that allow that to happen. And in fact, they almost encourage it because they have what's called an equalization protocol. If need goes down, then Powell is water is released out of Powell to, to bring need back up. And so the more you overuse mead, the more you release out of power. Until both of them reach crisis level, which they did last year, and they went into a tier one. Um, what was crazy to me is these letters went out. If you read them, really clear um, that, hey, you can't operate the Colorado River the way you've been doing it. Literally days after that came out, because of a little bit better water supply this year. Federal government lifted the tier one yeah. water yeah. restrictions on I I yeah. beat my head against the wall when I when I heard that. I mean literally after these letters come out, saying don't do that. <laughs> and, and I no, I don't believe the federal regulators that do that because they're kind of bound by the two thousand and eight operating criteria that Technically, that's what those numbers say. Technically, that's what they were supposed to do. But it's like, really, you, you know, <laughs> did you have to? Did you have to lift them right now? <laughs> right after those letters went out. So I, I think it, I, I like, I like the fact that the state, the Colorado um, Water Commission, is starting to say, hey, you know, we've got a problem, but really, what we have is an overuse problem. Right now. Hopefully um, that will be heard and as new operating criteria is drafted. Uh, it's going to have to be, absolutely have to be taken into account. I can't imagine the states, other states, allowing operating criteria to go through like we had 20 years ago. Yeah. So, not, not much that we can do. I, I get it. That's a Federal level that we all just kind of have to sit back and watch. We certainly have to. Any questions for Ken? Or... Okay. I, I do have a question. I'm not sure it's formulated quite in my head quite yet, but I mean, one month, I mean, we've had discussion, quite a bit of discussion about, you know, one month's pretty, pretty blessed with water, blessed perhaps with more water because we a very active role in securing your water rights, etc. But um, uh, the, the the situation that you talked about with respect to kind of you know one day they say we can't do this, the next day we get actually a rainstorm and it's like I mean or a long period of rainstorms and it's like oh never mind we're good. And um, I mean we don't necessarily live and die by every rainstorm in one month, you know, I mean, or, or even even a given season. You know? Prolonged rain or not, right? Or prolonged drought, or prolonged drought. But I'm just curious about like whether our peers, you know, like other. I mean, I don't, I'm not asking like that about other water companies, but but essentially whether uh, other uh, um, other kind of contemporaries of ours uh, kind of operate in that kind of blinders on when the when the um, when the rain is falling and crisis when the, when the when the water's not, or you know, when the rain's not falling. So, and you don't necessarily need to name names, but is that a more pervasive uh, attitude within the water community, or is do you feel like the kind of proactiveness associated with long term planning is maybe taking a greater hold? I think it's taking a much greater hold. I'm seeing more and more other water providers really starting to take water conservation serious, really starting to um, talk about. It is our there unless that our storage component sufficient. Um, I, I know a number of other 
talk to some other water managers. Yeah, we really don't have much storage. You guys are pretty lucky. <laughs> Not lucky, we, we, <laughs> we managed our water grid now. Do you feel like the, the feds in that respect are behind the curve, or do you feel like they are, they are getting there? Well, I think they understand it. I, I don't know. I, I believe it's gonna be pretty difficult for the feds to come out with new operating criteria in the Colorado River. Like I think, well, I personally think it should, it, it, they, should they should live within the Colorado River Compact. They get they, 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 uh, way over here. They, they get 7.5 million acre feet. And they use 10, 11, 12 million acre feet a year. You can't, yeah, and, and I get it, there's a lot of, and I benefit because I eat strawberries and yeah. <laughs> almonds and you yeah. know, I, I, I like all that, I get that, but um, yeah, it, it has, to, I, I think there's um, going to be more recognition, but I don't know, I, <laughs> I, it's hard for me to predict. I do, I just do know that more and more and more entities are going to really treat the conservation really seriously. Ken, do you know, I mean, the, the Colorado really has the, the continental divide and the rainfall that, you know, gets stopped there um, as its sole water source, not just the Colorado, you know, there's the Arkansas and all that. Yeah. But that's it. We don't have any other water sources. California has an ocean. And do you know anything about what the time lag is for investing in developing other water sources like desalinization? Um, how long is it going to take them to do, you know, what's sort of equivalent to um, our, the energy transition that we're going through now? because there are other sources of water in California, they just aren't developed because it was cheaper to use the Colorado. That is true. I, uh, you know, if it's, if it's a major water storage project, uh, you know, Chimney Hollow took us 22 years to get a permit. <laughs> <laughs> if I can use that for an example. Um, I hope we won't have to use that for an example. I, let's hope not. Um, there are, you know, yeah, there are some projects they could do out there. I think they're looking a little harder, even more groundwater, um, projective use. Uh, a lot of their water goes out into the, into the ocean without, without being reused, and, and they're doing more of that. Um, they've got some unique struggles. Um, there's a lot of pushback on utilizing Moro Lake water. So that's been used since the early 30s. And so they have some struggles with actually losing some of their supplies, potentially. I don't know if that will happen. Um, there is a lot of water up north in Northern California in the Central California project. Um, how efficiently they can bring it down. Um, and ultimately though, I think it you know, in Colorado, we are in the Palmerton ditch right now today, and half of our ditches are out of priority today. And there's no water going down those ditches, uh, unless they have CDP or something like that. But, but yeah, I mean, in Colorado, we don't think of a thing about, hey, you call the ditch out, they shut the ditch off. And that doesn't happen in these lower basin states. Happen if you said the All American Canal is going to go out for a week. <laughs> Desalinization is really a, just an energy matter. You know, well, there's a plant that could be built pretty quick. Yeah, there's an energy load, but there's also, isn't, and I don't know the desal very well, but there's also like a, there's an effluent that comes out of desal that is not great. Um, I, mean, I assume it would be the sound. Um, yeah, so the desal is not. 
talk about themselves. It should be a last resort, is what yeah. you're saying. But they have Or just don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, honestly, the, the point Ken was making is maybe turn something off. <laughs> you know, and say, hey, is this really the priority? Right, you know. Well, yeah, and, and I understand. I did yeah. not know that they let clean water f- yeah. flow into salt water because they would never do such a profligate thing, you know? Yeah, um, Orange County has one of the biggest reclamation, water reclamation plant. I've actually had, a, I've had an opportunity to tour it here about five years ago. So they are starting to do that, and then they're using it to re- replenish aquifers. Um, so, but when you think of the effort of that one plant versus how many water count, millions and millions of acres we got all our music, uh, it's a drop in the bucket. But I think it's it's, it's, a, it's a good start. Um, and they're they they are they are doing they're they're I believe they're now talking about statewide. Water conservation man- mandates. Did it include agriculture? Um, don't know anything about it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's well, from an agricultural perspective, aren't they buying the farmers literally to not produce? So, I mean, that that's, seems to be that, that is happening in places. Crazy option, also, you know, where water conservation is probably the water. I mean, we talk about food shortages and all this other stuff. And now we're paying farmers not to produce food because of the water shortages. I, I, I would vote not to produce that crop. Okay. It should go over to China. <laughs> but yeah, I want them to produce almonds and strawberries because I go to the well, yeah. supermarket every day and buy those things. But I get it. Um, it's, yeah. it's a tough, it's not an easy issue. We could produce less thirsty crops and change our eating habits. Well, we could. You mean cut out strawberries? Do Kentucky. <laughs> 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 we could stop doing Kentucky bluegrass too. We're working on it hard here. I understand that. <laughs> All right. I took mine out. So, yeah, we could probably. Stick out here till about midnight. Talk about the Colorado River and, and uh, what California's doing, but but just I was encouraged with the state's letter, and I hope I hope there's some real I believe we really need our thought on the federal government as they go forward. They got to do that. Well, it's political. Yeah, yeah. That's what their problem is. Okay. Item 11, items for board, review of water board, bylaws, Ken, what are your thoughts about that? We just- I mean, You're not proposing any changes, are you? Um, we are not proposing any changes. We, water board just reviews it about annually, or biannually or so, but um, it's been, I don't know, over a year now, and we thought, you know, the organizational meeting in August, it would be a good time to see, see in a new member and look in your bylaws. So, um, only, only if the water board has anything they would like to see changed. We don't have any changes. Does anybody want to go through? Well, I, I don't I don't want to <laughs> Again, the point that I am reading through it makes all, all kinds of sense, except for the notifications. Whereas at one point in time, you have to notify or the minutes or the agenda need to be out to us within four days. And then another section is a, that need to be out in five days. It just makes sense that um, a little bit of yeah, consistency and easy for you know, <coughs> someone just you know make it all four days or whatever that might be. I again, new, new, new guy, you know, but. I think that's a liberty piece, I think, is what you're Yeah, I think one's a four day and then the other yeah, one's the three day. Yeah, the resolutions is five days too. So. And then what's the one in the back? Yeah, the resolutions. Right. By mail, it's days. five days and it doesn't say anything about electronic community or anything like that. I wouldn't suggest a change. I would suggest that staff maybe look at that to see if there is a change that could be suggested. I don't think we could or dismiss something on the fly. Yeah. 
Scheduled this fall. What we're going to do, we're going to invite, I thought we'd have Kyle Whitaker up here. Talk <laughs> talked about the Colorado River today, but um, we were going to do the Colorado River presentation and then the Union Reservoir. So we'll go okay. there. All right. All right. That, so that is coming soon, sooner than later. Anybody have any comments about the schedule of items coming up? Very good. Uh, informational item from the Water Board Correspondence. Those were attached to the packet. Yeah. Nothing else. Yeah. Uh, one other thing that keeps coming on my mind the water treatment plant in Wyoming. They're going, be, they're going to be modifications or upgrades or something a year or two. Or, is that still pending? That's or, still pending. Did you? Want it or do you want me to? So, um, we actually, the preliminary design was put together and then it was going to be a design build. And so it was put out to bid for the design build. It came in way higher than had originally been uh, projected. So, the actual timing of that has been um, pushed back. Currently, our water demand has not gone up any, and you know, so it doesn't look like we're trending up absolutely needing that uh, enlargement right away. So we believe we have a few years to, to continue to plan for it. That is our you know, next big project, and um, you know, I believe it's going to look really hard at the next rate setting uh, the cost of that project and that, what that means for rates, where the money comes from. Part of part of it will be bonds because part of it's an expansion of capacity. Part of it will be um, existing rates because it's a replacement. With one when it gets enlarged, then the way to get its water efficient decommission. So um, essentially, it's about half of its in, in new capacity and half of its replacing existing capacity. So we can run that status quo without any risks for a period of time? For, yeah, okay. we, we believe we're doing okay, especially this summer. We haven't sold water this summer. <laughs> it was all the rain. Uh, we really haven't. I think our peak day was around 27 NGD. 28. 28. 28 NGD day. Which we should have you know, for a few weeks been in the third or fourth thirties. And that's you know watching the news. Yeah, we're um, we're definitely still looking at that. And actually uh, when we do know more we'll see if we get the water plant engineer folks in the door there. I think peaking is a huge piece that we have to understand really, really well to that goes into that because peaking is manageable. Folks will get that figured out. We talked about it here. You got it. Mm -hmm. um, no, but but conservation does actually speak to peaking as well, and so we can we can 
that's one of those places where I think composition really could maybe ease us away from a big project or reduce the size of a big project. Yeah. And, and even postpone it. Very important. I don't know if you can postpone it because there's going to be new treatment regulations, right? Well, that, that too. Uh, yeah, that's kind of yeah, that's my problem. Problem. Um, but but certainly, you know, sizing plants is if you, if you do it cheaper, that'd be great. Great. I do. So um, <clears throat> there was a while there where we were really uh, about a year or two ago, so a year or two months ago, something like that, where we were really talking quite a bit about like what this next kind of like reasonably foreseeable project was because we were trying to figure out like exactly how to set the the caching rule. And I think what what was decided was, of course, that we would go backward in time rather than kind of like forward in time. So go backward to like, okay, well, how much did like the gap uh, cost, right? Instead of looking forward and and forward, it seemed like we were talking quite a bit about like like union pump, you know, the the, the pump back and all that kind of thing. Right? And then of course, I, I haven't, we haven't heard much about that at all since, probably because it's quite a ways out there. But we were talking about it just from the perspective of like, should we think about that project as something to to um, to, to I don't know, set the caching new course or something. So. Um, I mean, is the is, is that type of project like the, the pump back type of project? Is that is that so far out that it's really not something that we're talking about very extensively at the moment, or is that something that is included in this like union reservoir discussion that you were alluding to? Um, yeah, it, it, it's part of the whole union reservoir enlargement discussion in the <coughs> union of operations, um, although it's, it's weighs it more heavily on the new new supply perspective of that. But um, yeah, that's really just a matter of we might need to, to review, review the cost estimates for that project and compare that. To, you know, that. That can certainly be something that we look at as, you know, in comparative costs of maybe that program and other things. Yeah, that's, but we wouldn't have it by September, but no, no, of course. we can certainly to, to bring that addition to the Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I'm invisible back here behind the line. Um, as long as somebody can see your hand, that's key. Yeah. What can so I? Um, the, this is almost a cost plus kind of a discussion about where the fees in, in lieu should be. And what about a market? discussion because if they didn't you know if they had to get the water from somewhere else they'd be paying a lot more so is is should should a year ago the public raised that point this is you know why why are we giving our water away for free you know um, so uh, I'm just asking why or why don't why do we only seem to consider the the costs and, and the economic needs as opposed to um, you know it's not like we're a cash heavy municipality is it because of the enterprise organization of the waterworks or what is it what's the reason you know I think we've simply included that information occasionally um, which we which. I agree with you, Marcia, that we included that information when we had brought a cash and lieu change forward, and that's what, <laughs> that, that did get the discussion going about, you know, why, mm -hmm. why don't we reevaluate? That's when we, you know, set the, set the current fee and... Uh, we did kind of split the difference yeah. on that adjustment, as I recall. You know? Um, I, I, I feel like Looking at the next project or the or the current project, because I think the next project may be quite far out because of conservation and flat demands. But looking at the current project costs, I think align much better with cost of service principles that are recommended for rate setting, um, and in this case, system development charge setting. And so you say this is what it's costing, and this is what you pay. Um, and market is lovely, um, but sometimes market can 
be driven by things that aren't exactly cost of service. And cost of service is highly defensible. And it's there's an element of fairness. And and I want to be clear, I'm I'm not pro-developer, I'm not anti-developer. I think developers should pay their fair portion of new demands onto the system. And so you look at, okay, what's this new or current project doing in terms of new demands? And that's where your cost comes from. When you're looking at market, you can be looking at things that aren't actually reflective of the cost that the utility, this utility bears to, to yeah, make and, that new supply. And, and that exactly is the question, right? It is Market is different than cost plus. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and yet, we're talking about, well, we can't afford to stick to the original plan on the water treatment replacement. So shouldn't we be making up? And, and I would say that that would be one thing I would love to have this group know more about is there's the system development charges and then there's the well water requirement. And those are, those are fees that run parallel. Mm -hmm. and so there should be a system development charge that is looking at costs of water treatment and getting that money. And, you know, whatever water treatment element is expansive, that should be attributed to the system development charges. But the cash in lieu is really about the raw water component. And so cash in lieu shouldn't be supporting no treatment plant by that thought because it's it's a raw water fee system development charge should be. And I did kind of conflate those terms in my earlier statement about cost of service. Yeah. So that's all right. But and and I I I freely admit that I'm not that subtle or that fair. You know, it's like our city needs this stuff. Let's make sure we can get it. And let's get it from the system development charges, but not the cash. I'm all for getting them up, <laughs> to be clear. Um, and I'm also very much in line with what I think your the thrust of your point is, is the ratepayer shouldn't be paying for expansion. Development should be paying for expansion. Growth pays for growth. Yeah. No, you don't think. I don't think that's happening. Do they extend it off to? I, okay, I want to be clear. I'm not throwing stones at system development charges. I would just like to know more. And, and I think it so, is. I do think, I do trust the city's analysis of that, that system development charges are capturing, particularly between cash and and system development charges, we are capturing growth paying for growth. Um, but it's always worth checking. And I believe you guys check every, what, five years you do a rate study? Yeah, it has to look down the rates. And then yeah. the next rate study will look yeah, at the system yeah. development fee. Yeah. Because it'll be for that. Although the rate payer sh should pay for the depreciation and replacement on the, the existing facilities. So um, the developers obviously can't put, can't pay for the new plant all by themselves because they're not they're only a little piece of the reason we need to replace it. Yeah. Chris, you got a comment? I was just gonna say that our system development fees were reviewed about three years ago, so we have disconnected rates and system development fees in that cycle. Um, mm -hmm. So system development fees would come up another two years after rates, after yeah. do this rate study. And, and um, when I say I would love to know more about system development fees, I just but I think this group would be well informed to, to understand system development charges and cash and loo and how they work together. And, and to, to know what developers to are seeing both of those things. Economically, things have changed significantly over the last three years. So, oh, so much. So our system development fees were based upon uh, estimates that were done five years ago. Um, well, food for thought. It is, <laughs> but I, I think I mean, it's a lot we don't understand. Be nice to understand it more thoroughly, but uh, we'll still learn learn new. And, and I have good faith in staff. Like I do feel like staff has it well in hand. Um, they're just there for us probably to ask questions. Okay. Uh, well, that covers cash and new one our time in over and what's that in September is Ken said we all start looking at filling the gap and how that impacts it. Uh, discuss future water board agendas. Uh, only if the um, water board has additional items. 
Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we've got a little bit here to mull over. Yeah, yeah. 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 got some options there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What else for the good of the cause? What we uh, hope, I was hoping for 15 minutes anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Do you bring more to the meeting next time? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> He's really asking for one of those snacks that you make 